Hey, everybody. Welcome to a fun Tuesday evening here on the Comic Cart Live channel. I'm going to have Jim Afu down with me in just a few moments. So uh, welcome to the show, as always. It's nice to have everybody in here early. Kavi, nice to see you. I knew you'd be here, Kavi. I was hoping uh, hoping you'd be here. I know you'll have lots of questions for us as we go throughout all this. But uh, yeah, nice to see everybody here. Rick Welch got my first piece by uh, Jim in the mail yesterday from Calf Live. Congratulations. Calf Live is the gift that keeps on giving. I keep getting a lot of nice emails from people about the show from last weekend. And uh, don't forget on Thursday, I'm actually going to be doing a basically an unboxing of all of the artwork that I've gotten from Jiggy. So uh, one of those packages over there is one is I think 35, 36 pieces of art from Jiggy's crew. So we'll be opening that on the show on Thursday. And I've been getting uh, several scans from those people whose artworks I'm not mailing from Ken's 4C Comics and also from Tatiana. So I've got scans. I'll show those off on Thursday as well, but everything looks phenomenal. So thank you for being here tonight. But, you know, I'm not going to leave Jim in the green room any longer. He's been hanging out and uh, we just met a few moments before the show started. So now you get to see me again, Jim. How you doing? Good, man. How you doing, Bill? I can't complain. Very busy day today. I picked up a few pieces of art to add to my collection. So it's always a good day when that happens. Nice. Can I ask what you what you got? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to show it off because I'll show it off on Thursday. But I, I picked up my first uh, Mark Silvestri Uncanny X-Men page. Oh, wow. Which, so that was nice. And because I wasn't reading comics in the 90s. So Silvestri was like never high on my list. But as I've kind of been rounding out my collection a bit and X-Books were always at the top of my collecting area along with Thor, um, I wanted to get at least a representative example from all the major X-Men artists. So I happened to see one today that was, that actually had a, had a, had an art kind of angle on it. And I was like, all right, that's the page. I'm going to, I'm going to get that one. And then the, the other page was a, uh, Lea Aloha piece by, uh, from Spider-Woman. Actually. Oh, sweet. I've always, nice. always really admired that. I love, uh, Bob Wyatt's inking on, on, on Steve's work. And so I, saw a page today and I was like, all right, that's it. So I'm, I picked those two up today and uh, very excited about it because both both creators, I don't think I've ever owned anything by either of them. Those are good picks. Did, um, super nerdy question, did Dan Green ink the Sylvester? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's like some of my favorite Sylvester, the real like elegant uh, X-Men Sylvester stuff. It just... So, yeah, so now you're making me. I'm going to show just one panel from it. Let's do it. <laughs> I, mean, I loved it. I, I, you know, it just it ma it made me smile. But I'll show you. The, it's the art panel, I guess, from this. So let's see if I can show it without showing too much here. Uh, here we go. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. So that's Gorgeous. Psylocke and Colossus is getting her to pose for him. I mean, how that's funny. Cool. I mean, it's funny. It's awesome. Everything about it. And yeah, Stan Green ink. So that's I was very beautiful. pleased. Yeah, when wow. I saw it. Yeah. Well done. Um, yeah, well thank you very much. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's always good that you know. I, I I don't know. I've been very lucky since um, since I've been doing these live streams and whatnot. I've been able to kind of get back into art collecting. I, I had a long period where I wasn't buying any original art, just thinking about how I was going to put my kids through college and other other financial challenges I had going on. But the last couple of years is, has been good, you know, to uh, for me as far as uh, collecting and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I feel really fortunate to be able to be adding artwork to my collection. Do, you know, before we even talk about you, do you collect? I mean, do you have a small collection, big collection? Uh, I do. I have a small collection. And it's based around um, mostly trading originals with peers of mine. So, you know, I've got stuff from like Scotty Young, my mm -hmm. my buddy Mike Huddleston, Jason Sean Alexander, who we were talking about the, before the show started. Um Nicholas Namiri I don't, is part of Kim Jung's uh, crew. I have a piece of his that I'm looking at right now. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, there's an Ashley Wood on my wall oh, right there. That's yep. a huge original painting that Ash did in San Diego Comic-Con 2007. I convinced Ashley to come out to one of our live art parties where we paint on big canvases while DJs are spinning records. And so um, he did that live. And at the oh, end man. of the night, he just gave it to me for coordinating the night. And he's like, well, I can't fly back to Australia with this. So 
<laughs> there you go. So, um, but yeah, I, uh, Mike Allred, I'm trying to remember, uh, Mike Mignola, um, I've got a Hellboy drawing that I traded with him. Um, that was a huge, like, it's funny too, because you gauge like kind of where you're at with your career and the recognition and respect you get. It's a strange thing, but I approached Mignola at a Portland con out here in like 2018 and was going through his portfolio and he had these smaller pencil drawings of Hellboy. And I said, Hey Mike, I, I want this one. Like I want to buy this. And he looked at me for a minute. He knew, he knows who I am. We've had conversations before, but he was like, uh, why don't we, why don't we trade for it? And before he could finish the sentence, I like ran <laughs> back to my table and grabbed my portfolio and I brought the portfolio over to his table and he was looking through my portfolio. And then suddenly Jeff Darrow showed up and started looking at my art over Mike's shoulder. And I really hadn't met Jeff before, but obviously I'm a huge fan of his stuff. Mm -hmm. So I had these two masters, you know, like looking through my work. So it can be, I mean, that made me nervous, but them being like, Hmm. Oh, like getting little, reactions out of them i could tell it was like okay they're these masters are signing off on my work you know? right and it was funny because mike mike finished looking through the whole portfolio was like you do too much like there's too much in here he's like why don't you just pick a piece and, and ship it to me because i can't travel home with this anyway so he's like <laughs> i'll just give you my address and and just just you pick something that you think I like and just ship it to me. So, um, but it was cool, man, to know that Mignola was willing to trade. Right. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I mean, it, it, Ruben uh, in our chat mentioned that that's, you know, I, we've all heard that before. Artists like to trade a lot, uh, you know, to uh, exchange artworks and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, that's got to be a darn cool feeling, you know, to have Mike acknowledge you know that you know and, and and trust you to send him a piece that he he, he felt that uh that you felt that he would like so yeah it's gotta be pretty cool yeah so yeah you never know what you're gonna get in situations like that and um with my comic book series i've done these the last two girl scouts create her own series i've done at image i've had variant covers by different artists for each issue and i always ask my variant cover artists if you work orig on original art, not digitally, can I trade you for that original art cover? Like, can I mm -hmm. get first dibs on that? So I've gotten a lot of original art that way. And it's even more important to me because it's another artist doing my characters, my creation. So, you know, I've got like a Scotty Young version of Girl Scouts, Jim Rugg. Um, I'm trying to think who else here. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the list goes on. But um the only person I couldn't get was Bill Sienkiewicz, who he sent me like the original line drawing of the three girls. Uh -huh. And then in 2017, I was at San Diego and I saw the original painting. He did a full blown painting for the cover he did for me. And it was hanging on the wall of his like gallery display area in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was like 10 grand or something, you know, or more, but little out of my price range for right he couldn't trade that one but uh but yeah, i guess yeah. it, you know i with sinkavich i feel like i'm pushing the envelope anyway just even asking this guy to do a, a variant and we became buddies and he said yes but it, it like you don't want to um you don't want to push it too far with, with with some people that i consider masters it's like you don't want to take it too far you know right no I, I get it i get it and it's uh you know this uh, we've heard that before i had nick patera on less than a month ago and you know he mentioned that he liked to get the variant cover artist work when uh, they were traditional as well and so he owned a lot of uh, those pieces just you know there's something about uh you know what well it's your t it's it's your book you know and you're having kind of a say i'm sure in it, who who's going to be drawing those variant covers mm -hmm. so it's uh so you're getting people that you really like anyway. So if the opportunity also presents itself where you can actually own the artwork as well with your characters on it, that, I mean, that's uh there's nothing cooler than that, I think. Yeah. It's, and it's also, you know, you're seeing everyone I chose to do variants. They all have their own unique 
individual style. So to see everyone's approach to doing my characters, it just makes it that much more exciting, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, very, that's awesome. That's totally awesome. Yeah. Like I, told you, I wanted to be an artist. So it's always cool talking with creators, getting, you know, and getting their perspective on, and especially their personal works, stuff that, uh, you know, you're not doing for hire, but it's your own stuff. And um, I, there can't be anything more rewarding than, than something like that. And so, so image has been a good partner. I yeah. Imagine. Yeah. I, I've uh, been doing my creator own books through them since about 2001. Um, I started off with Oni press when Bob Shrek started Oni with um, his partner, Joe Nosmack at the time. Mm -hmm. and that, that was kind of one of my big breakthrough moments in the late nineties, illustrating Kevin Smith's clerks comics doing my first creator owned Girl Scout series there in like 98, 99. And then uh, Shrek quick, quickly left after he formed Oni to become the Batman group editor at DC. So, you know, DC kind of made him this offer he couldn't refuse and moved him out to New York. And so as soon as he left, I mean, I felt like I was one of his soldiers mm -hmm. in that era of Oni. So I, I wound up meeting Jim Valentino and bringing my all my stuff over to Image, where my relationship with them is I just sort of pitch them whatever whatever project I want, and they usually say yes. And then I don't even talk to them about scheduling or anything until I'm like three or four issues completely done in the can, you know. So right. it's once I get the green light where I know I have a publisher. I basically tell Eric Stevenson like, well, okay, I'll talk to you in like a year or however long it takes because I want to make sure if I'm doing six issues, I've got three or four completely done before we even solicit issue one. Cause I don't want late books. Like I don't want to piss off retailers. I don't want to disappoint fans. So if we're doing six issues, which I did with this last series, this uh, girl scout stone ghost thing, um, I want six issues coming out six months in a row. Like I don't want lateness, you know, it just, it just looks bad, man. And like in the era we live in today where everyone expects everything immediately, it just seems like if you tell someone your book is late, it's just, it's just such a bizarre thing to even say at this point, because right. we live in, we just live in this streaming culture of just immediate, it's like, what do you mean I have to wait? You no, know, it's true. Just waiting Whatever. 30 days in between <laughs> issues for younger fans. I think they're like, why is this just not all coming out in one, you know, thing? It's like, well, it will when the trade comes out, but. Right. Well, you know, it's like when a Netflix series starts and you actually have to wait every week for, to see it. You don't want to anymore. You're so used to it's it just dumps it and it's there. Right. I don't want to wait a month and a half to see all Obi-Wan. Right. I want to I want to see it all now. So yeah. even even my mentality, I haven't even watched it yet because I'm, I'm half tempted to wait till it's done so I can watch it all at once. Right. So uh, so you're right. The mentality today is, you know, we, we should be able to get it immediately if it you know rather than waiting. And so you don't want to be off schedule at all. I mean, I think that that's 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 the professional way to do it is to make sure you have more than half of the book in the can before it gets started. So, you know, you're going to be on time with the rest of the books. Definitely. So uh, let's see. The insidious monk said, very cool to have your own characters done last year. I had Jim do one of mine. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what that was. <laughs> insidious will tell us. Okay, cool. But, uh, but yeah, no, that's awesome. So, you know, um, we just kind of jumped in and mixed around here, but tell me a little bit. Of, I mean, <clears throat> I remember when I first started collecting original comic art, it was probably when I it was probably around the time it was around 97, 98. And I, I remember seeing you in artist alleys back in the day. Um, I don't think we ever had the opportunity to talk, but so, so tell me a bit about your start, you know, in the, in the business or and maybe, you know, kind of what was your, what were your early steps on finding your way into into doing comics and create our own work because you know your your work your your work has a very clearly a very independent feel to it right when i when i see it i mean there's lots of things that i think about when i see it but I, you know what what i don't i wouldn't talk artists but what what i think about is like i just remember back like when i was in high school in the in the 80s 
it was really cool to kind of like make your own independent little books. You maybe would write your own poems in them and you wrapped your own art around the, the words. And I, I look at yours and and your word, your, your art is like kind of like poetry, you know, within that same vein of trying to be creative uh, and, and try to like tell a whole story on a single page with, with not necessarily telling a story. And, I, and so, uh, you know, with having to be over, uh, you know, writing the words all the, all the way through it to make it I don't even know where I'm trying to go with that, but you get what it's, and I don't even remember what those were called. They're like ash cans or something like yeah. we would make them as, as kids for fun. And I see that, you know, that you might, all I can think of is that you have to be one of the happiest guys drawing, you know, throughout, yeah, yeah. The, throughout the day. And I just expect, you know, music's playing and, uh, and, and you're not having a dull moment while you're working on anything on, on the table. So now that, yeah. now that I've like, totally got off the original question, but let's go back to that though. Yeah, no, but I, I'll address what you said because I think it's important. And what uh -huh. I think what you're referencing is I definitely came from zine culture. Mm -hmm. Underground, zine, yeah. self-published, Xerox, punk rock, ash cans, whatever you want to call them. And that started, I grew up in St. Louis and I started working when I was 15 years old for a local publisher in St. Louis called Artline Studios. And it was just these two guys that were self-publishing black and white comics. And they basically took me under their wing as their studio apprentice. So, I mean, I was doing like straight grunt work, man, like just erasing pencils off of inked pages, inking backgrounds on some of the stuff they were doing. But this was like pre-internet. This was like early 90s. So mm -hmm. I didn't know how comics were made. And these dudes were like 10 years older than me. So they were the first guys that showed me like, Here's the 11 by 17 Bristol board you work on. Here's a T square. Here's the ink you use. Here's the brushes you use. So I got my feet wet working with them. And, and it, it, it kind of, um, I started off falling in love with inking first. I was always drawing, but I was inking for them. So I kind of set my sights on, I think I want to be an inker in comics. Like I just want to be like the next Scott Williams or, Klaus Jansen or something. And then I graduated high school, went to art school in Kansas city at the Kansas city art Institute, uh, met a bunch of guys that were self-publishing their own comics, their own zines, their own punk kind of, uh, publications. Also met Mike Huddleston, who's two years older than me. Um, he was the best guy in the illustration department and he was doing his own comics and he kind of took me under his wing and became a mentor to me. And we eventually became a penciler inker team and started showing submissions to all the editors we could approach at comic conventions. And we got a couple of gigs like here and there, we got some things, but um, what around 95, I started self-publishing Girl Scouts as my own little independent comic. And I was distributing it myself throughout the Midwest. and it started to catch on and like word of mouth started to spread about it. And then I eventually met Scott Lobdell at a comic con in 96 and he wound up bringing all my stuff back to Marvel comics. And I somehow got this job with Marvel doing this book called generation X underground special, which was a black and white one shot starring generation X, the teenage X-Men characters. Mm -hmm. And I met a young assistant editor in the Marvel office named Jason Liebig, who somehow slipped this under the radar, like got Bob Harris to like glance at this and say, yeah, make this book. And then we, it wound up coming out and, um, and I was showing samples of this book before it came out around in, in um, San Diego in 97. And that's when I met Bob Shrek and Kevin Smith, and they hired me to draw the clerk's book. So I tried to get in as an inker. I was self-publishing. I got this crazy gig with Marvel. And then Bob was smart enough to be like, this kid's on some unique edgy shit. He's the perfect artist for this weird Kevin Smith thing we're going to do. And convinced Kevin to let me draw it. And then once Clerks and Gen X came out, it was like, boom, my name was in the the limelight of comics basically and i was able to get consistent work from that so and and having that zine kind of um punk diy sensibility also got me into opportunities like um 
doing live art in nightclubs. Um, and then record industry people saw me doing that. And then I started getting offers doing like album covers, flyers. So then my art started to seep into other outside areas outside of comics, like illustration, advertising, doing character design for animated shows. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of just mushroomed into, okay, now I'm a guy with unique style and the style is what I'm selling. Like the style is my brand as cliche as that is to say. And that was, that, that's, that took off for me basically. Oh, sorry, I'm reading through some of the chats here, but no, that's, that's totally cool. So what, what year was the, the clerks and the, the X-Men book really? When did that come out? I got the X-Men gig in 97 when I was a senior about to graduate yeah. from college. Um, I, San Diego was 97 when I met Bob and then both clerks and Gen X came out in 98. So 98 was kind of like my big breakout year. You know, and then I followed the clerk's book with my first Girl Scouts miniseries at Oni. And then Kevin and I reunited to do a clerk's Christmas special that came out in like 99. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the early 2000s, I started getting offers from Marvel with um, mostly Brian Bendis spearheading with Ultimate Marvel Team Up. He was writing this book where like weird indie guys like me were drawing each individual issue. So I met Brian when he was still like at caliber, like back in the day. So mm -hmm. he was kind of um, one of the big breakthrough guys that, that started in indie and then became Marvel's golden boy with all like ultimate Spider-Man. And so he was kind of able to bring some of us weirdos into the mix in the early two thousands. And um, I started doing a couple fill in issues here and there on various Spider-Man books um, and just kept busy, man. It's just kind of like, uh, all mushroomed out from there, you know? Uh, but it was cool. It was cool. Like starting with one plan, which was, I just want to ink like the X-Men monthly comic. That's my dream mm -hmm. or Batman to being like, Oh no, I, that didn't work out. So now I develop my own drawing style. I'm writing and creating my own characters. I have my own sensibility and now I'm branding that sensibility into what I put out into the world, you know? And, and I developed, I, I guess, like a, a, a healthy cult following for that. Yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, that's more, you really did kind of uh, blaze your own trail there at the end of the day. I mean, but what was it when you were working with Kevin, what was that like? I mean, you know, my feel good movie, whenever I want to, get us get a smile i always uh you know love watching jay and silent bob i mean i go back to clerks a lot but yeah, yeah. uh that i could watch that movie at least once a month and i'd still enjoy it and it wouldn't yeah. be overdone i still I, I i love his stuff but i the the original clerks movie still hits home for me because we there was a screening of that on my campus when i was in college and it was like this guy and his friends from new jersey just made this movie it just made it. It's black and white. It looks super raw. It look, and I had friends in the photo video department at art school and they were all like, wow, that, you can do this. Anyone can make a movie. So I had this admiration for him before I ever met him. And um, Chasing Amy had just come out and was a huge success. So he was in San Diego in 97 doing panels and promoting Chasing Amy. So uh when we met he was very nice and very accommodating and him and his friends him and his crew just reminded me of the guys i grew up with in st louis like they just reminded me of like midwest dudes that were into comics and smoking cigarettes and just like talking shit and uh you know uh his script was the very first script i ever worked from so it was the very first script i ever saw so i had to call Sh Bob Shrek and ask him like, I didn't even know what um, like POV stood for. Mm -hmm. And the script, it's like, this is from Randall's POV. And I'm like, what's POV? So Shrek had to like break down some of the stage direction for mm -hmm. me. And, and um, 
obviously Kevin's scripts are incredibly verbose. So when I was doing my layouts for the pages and stuff, I, I was kind of like, where do the drawings go? If you know what I mean, it's like <laughs> certain panels have three paragraphs of dialogue. Like where, so where, Bob, where, where does my work come in? <laughs> yeah. So Bob was like a really good editor and, um, Bob's like an old school editor, like him and Diana Schutz. They come from that school of like editor as art director and curator and tastemaker of like knowing what team to put together, knowing how to guide a team. And this was even before I had a computer and could do email. So I would call Shrek and then he'd call me back so I didn't have to pay for the phone call. And we would just kind of go through my page layouts that I had faxed him and he'd be like, think about this angle, think about doing this, think about this storytelling technique, think about having this much room for the dialogue, you know? So he, he was a really good guide for me, you know, and um, he lives out here and I see him still and we're still like really close friends. So I always make sure to uh, tease him every now and then to be like, you're partially responsible for, for this madness of like my career. Well, he encouraged uh, whatever, you. whatever you want to call I mean, it. But I was, day, he, he encouraged you to be yeah, you and that's, yeah. that's what made it work. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a great, it was a great experience. It was also the first time I worked with a professional letterer. So my buddy, Sean Conat, who was lettering Mike Allred's madman comics and had worked with Shrek on a lot of dark horse stuff. It was cool to actually send off the pencils to Sean, have him letter directly on the boards, FedEx them back to me. And then I would get so excited. I would tear open that FedEx box and take the pages out. And it looked like a real comic book. I mean, it looked right. like, you know what I mean, man? It had the feeling of like the lettering and the sound effects are there. Like all I have to do is ink the drawings now, but it, it made it feel so much more real and official to me. Like, I'm actually working in comics. Like this is, this is the real thing that's happening here, you know? So it, it was exciting, man. It was really, and you know, I was like 22 at the time. So I was still super naive and young and just f filled with adrenaline every day to be working on this stuff, you know? So right. it, was well, cool, yeah, man. Man. it was really cool. I'm sure, you you know, you don't think that you'd, uh, you know, you'd get to be doing it like right away at the age of 22 to really get a, you know, get, get a good start and to feel like you're working in comics. I mean, a lot of people had to grind, grind it out in apprenticeships or whatnot. And, uh, you know, so being able to actually be in a position where you're, you're, actually, you're really there, you know, you're getting it, getting to see your work, it get, uh, yeah, you know, like you said, lettered, and then comes back to you. I mean, that that had to be pretty cool. And I, and before I move too far, I want to, Jeff Wedding said uh, with a super chat that he's a cult follower of Food One. Thank so, you, Jeff. Thank you, yes. Jeff. Yes, we we definitely appreciate that. And Daryl, when we were talking about uh, uh, <laughs> about Kevin, he said so. Basically, as an inker, you were just a tracer. Yeah, that's yeah. That <laughs> yes. <laughs> when we went and saw Trace chasing Amy in the theater, and I was with my group of friends when that tracer scene mm -hmm. came on everyone leaned over in the aisle to look down at me <laughs> and, their asses off. and i was like this is the most inside baseball thing i've ever seen in a movie the whole tracer debate and the guy accusing uh jason lee of being the tracer is scott mosier kevin's mm -hmm. producer who i since have gone on to become really good friends with and um Scott and I wound up getting a couple optioning deals together on various like cartoon animated shows. Like we've worked together on some stuff. Great guy, but there was a huge benefit of becoming friends with Kevin and his crew because I wound up staying in touch with those guys. And even, like I said, doing a, a having business with, with Scott and, and mm -hmm. kind of having him as a consultant with um, Hollywood stuff, pitching shows, pitching. That's a whole other thing you know outside of comics and illustration is trying to get your ip made into tv or movies or animation um so it's cool to know like after 25 years of being in this i have um resources and connections that i can 
consult with, you know? Yeah, that's got to be the, the that side of the business has to be a lot of there's a lot to wade through. So it's, it's very good to have friends who've done it before and can can give you good advice. I mean, just really almost in anything, you know, I, I, oh, yeah. in business with me, it's like if I didn't have people that I could ask questions on things that are kind of outside my, my realm, you know, I wouldn't I, I definitely wouldn't be here today if I didn't have people smarter than than me in certain areas to kind of help guide me along and show me the right the right direction so it, it's the same in all all businesses especially when you're self-employed you got to be a good listener right you got to and, and you got to find great ways to make friends that uh you know that um because it just helps get you out there and, and at the end of the day it helps further your career a little bit and lets you do really what you want to do what you know what you're best at which is you know making the art and uh, you know, let let the other guys kind of give you the advice to kind of steer some of those things. But uh, IP wise, ha have you ever what's what's been some of your more interesting things? Where you, you you know, with well, what about with Girl Scouts? I mean, how is how's that been? A, uh, so that's that's like really you've like you said you've worked on that for a very long time. So as uh, as your own thing, I mean, what's have you had that option in any way, or what or talks to have something like that done? Or yeah, it, it's funny, man. It's Girl Scouts has been option like four different times over the last 20 years. Um, in 2015, we made a live action pilot for Ron Howard's production company called New Form Digital. And um, I got teamed up with this brilliant director named Mike Diva. Uh, Mike currently got recruited by SNL and moved to New York about a year ago and is now uh, directing all the fake commercials and digital shorts at SNL. Mm -hmm. He's, he's brilliant, but we made this live action Girl Scouts pilot. You can uh, check it out on YouTube. Just enter in Girl Scouts pilot and the whole 15 minute short is there. And um, Jason mentioned my friend, Hope Harris, who yeah. played one of the Girl Scouts and she wound up being one of Jason's reference models for spawn and various other projects. So that was an awesome thing. The, the show did not get picked up as a series, but we still have this cool pilot. And then in 2020, I optioned Girl Scouts to Disney, of all people. Uh, Disney was going to make a Adult Swim-style animated block of edgy rated R uh, cartoons. For That's hard to imagine. For a different streaming channel outside uh -huh. of Disney+. Plus. So... This one was huge, man. This one, uh, Margot Robbie and her husband were producers on it. So I was working with her production company, which is called Lucky Chap. I was working with Starburns, the guys who made the first season of Rick and Morty. Mm -hmm. They were going to be the animation house. And we had Peter Chung from Eon Flux attached as our director. So wow. we were really going for it, man. And I got my friend Kate Freund attached as the head writer. Her and I wrote the script together. We worked on it for all of 2020. And long story short, at, in December of 2020, Disney wound up pulling the plug on the entire adult animated program. Like someone high up, I'm assuming saw this and was like, we're not making <laughs> How do we agree like this? <laughs> animated shows. They're like, we, we're spending this money on more Marvel and more Star Wars and, you know, but the executives we were working at, well, we, we were working with were really young, cool, enthusiastic, hip people that I was like, we're, so we're making my Girl Scouts cartoon with them as like weed dealers and there's violence and crazy psychedelic shit and sex. And they're like, yeah, it's, the, this is the future. It's like, this we're, is we're this is, this is <laughs> And, uh, but we tried, man, we try, you know, I always try my hardest with all this kind of stuff. And all you can do is, is put your whole self into it. And if it doesn't work out, it's like, that's on them. They, we did our job. Like we did the best pitch packet we could do the best script for the pilot. Mm -hmm. I did all this development art, you know, um, but with, with Hollywood stuff, it's like, you never know a hundred percent if it's going to happen until you're actually signing that contract that says we're making season one of your show, you know, like an optioning deal is cool, but it's, you don't want to tell too many people because if it doesn't happen, then 
everyone says, "What happened to your show?" Right, it's your, it's your fault if it didn't yeah. if it didn't come to fruition. And and Rick asked kind of the question I was going to ask about getting paid, but uh, the, you know the other question I had for you was, um, you know, when something like that happens, when it falls apart for whatever reason, either they fail to deliver or they decide to back out. I mean, is it written into your agreement that you are free to you know try to you know seek out someone else to work with immediately? Are you are you kind of sometimes strung into an agreement that you know maybe it has to take another year to play out before you can move on and look for other interested parties? Uh, this was, I will say Disney was very accommodating in this because as soon as they terminated our agreement, they got me back the IP and we got everything back within like three months, which is a very quick turnaround mm -hmm. Sometimes you can wait a year or more. So they knew, they knew that they kind of screwed us all over and uh, they were very quick to get everything back to all the creators. So I do have the right and I'm still working with producers to shop the IP around. So we'll see what happens, but um, it's just a crap shoot, man. Like, get, you know, it, getting a show made, what you're really asking is you're asking a corporation to invest millions of dollars into an IP that might be known as a cult thing in the world of comics, but these corporations, they want the guarantee that you're making basically the next Rick and Morty, the next Adventure Time. They want to know that, is this going to have merch? Is it going to be sold in Target? Is there going to be backpacks? Is there going to be toys? Like they want, you know what I'm saying? I mean, these oh, are very course. obvious things to say, but I was serious when I was like, yeah, Disney, someone high up was like, we want more Star Wars and Marvel. Like, this is a huge gamble making rated R crazy, violent, edgy, sexy cartoons with stuff that might have a small cult following or whatever. So mm -hmm. um, the other alternative is, you know, you just crowdfund something, uh, make crowdfund a Girl Scouts animated pilot and make it yourself and then hope that the right people see that and then you get a deal, you know, but um Right now, I'm super busy with uh, other stuff, but <laughs> that's the only, that's the problem, man. Is there's not enough time in the day to do all this stuff, but um, you know, one one thing leads to another, so we'll see. Yeah, well, you, you need like a big production company around you as part of uh, the you know the, of, of your 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 own business venture, Jim. You need to have, uh, but but how do you do that, right? I mean, I'm we, you're at that growing pain stage where it's like if you could just afford to bring you know. Pay some people the time to do that. They could probably get something done one way or another. Well, even if it, if it was a Kickstarter approach, yeah. but uh, but how do you how do you get past that little tipping point to to get there where you can actually have those kind of people around you to, to do that work for you full time rather than yeah. in their free time? And with with all that comes a whole other set of headaches as well. Like there there was a slight sense of relief for me when they wound up passing on the cartoon. We had spent all of twenty twenty working our butts off and doing zoom meetings with the whole crew, all the producers. And man, when they passed on it, like it was right before the holidays, I had this sort of sense of relief of like, you know what? I'm just going to go back to drawing my comic. I can write and draw whatever I want. I don't have to have zoom meetings about it. I don't have to have anyone's approval. I get to make my book, write it, draw it, letter it, color it. Image publishes it with no questions asked, no editorial infer interference. And so that's kind of what I spent 2020 and 2021 doing was like, I'm going to deal with the trauma of having the show not work by just fully immersing myself in being in my studio and, and doing my own book again. Mm -hmm. And if, if animated stuff happens down the road, that's cool. But there's also part of me as a um, singular creator where I just sort of sometimes I'm like, I just need to be alone to like make this thing that I want to make. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, I, right, I, I, well, I, you, I, you get to choose your writers. I mean, you didn't sound like you were doing that with the, with the pilot and whatnot as well, but you get to have a total creative freedom and, as long as you stay there. I mean, and as long as you're comfortable, you know, with, with your IP staying in that level, I mean, and, and why wouldn't you be then, then that's all right. You know, I mean, everybody, yeah. I, I don't, I wouldn't have any problem with that. And, and given your background, you know, design background and everything, everything like that. I mean, that sounds kind of where that's probably like your comfort zone, right? You feel, you feel more at ease just uh, keeping it where it's all within your control. 
Yes. And that's okay, right? I mean, you, we're not all looking to uh, to always have like to, to be the superstar. You don't have to be to, to have have fun and enjoy your life and everything like that. So yeah, I get it. I totally get that. So hey, I don't want. There's been some questions passed through here, and yeah. I've, I've skipped because I missed them, but I've been start highlighting them. So let me try to pull up a couple in here. I saw one from Kavi. Uh, for when it's let's see, would love to learn more about the history of Skull Funk Radio, Jim's podcast, and how much music interacts with his creative process. Any uh, all-time fave albums, artists, and songs? Oh, man. Uh, if you get me talking about music, that would be like a seven-hour. <laughs> but So for those that don't know, I, I have a, a podcast called Skull Funk Radio, free on Spotify or on the web, skullfunkradio.fireside.fm. And it's basically just me hosting an hour-long mixtape of – Music I've been collecting since I was like 11 years old, ranging from the genres of 60s and 70s funk and soul, 80s and 90s hip hop, 70s and 80s punk rock, ska, reggae, jazz, fusion, psychedelic, 60s stuff, basically every, everything. And um, music is, is a huge influence on me, my art style, uh, my approach to working. So music and comics i mean those are those are basically my two big uh obsessions and passions and i've sort of fused them both together in that the art style i'm depicting on paper is sort of supposed to be a rhythmic interpretation of music in a way if that makes sense like the lines i'm drawing the curves i'm using the splattery textural nature can reflect a punk sensibility or a jazz sensibility or street sensibility with hip hop graffiti. So to me, both of these things are just completely interlocked. Going back to my childhood where I would basically escape my family by just locking myself in my room and listening to music and drawing. It just stuck with me. Like so you're doing it. That's what you're doing today, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. It just stuck with me my whole life. And, and as a kid, I, a teenager, I was like, how do I turn sitting into a room listening to music and drawing into a job like how do i do that as a job and i w i actually somehow managed to figure out how to do that so um i always tell people sometimes like my whole career is basically just an excuse to listen to 10 hours of music a day do, do you know what i mean so it, um so yeah if, if people want to check that out it's it's a free mixtape and then we do a live stream version of the show on Sundays, um, shrubhomevideo.com, 3 p.m. Pacific time. It's an hour live stream of me drawing and then playing a mixtape on top of the of the footage of me actually drawing. Oh, cool. So uh, where, yeah, did, where did that stream from? What, what platform? Um, it's just, it's on uh, my buddy's website. Uh, it's called shrubhomevideo.com. Okay. And it's Rob Schraub, the creator of Scud, the Disposable Assassin. Got it. So Rob on Sundays on his website has a full day of original programming. And my show starts the whole thing off at 3 p.m. Pacific time. That's pretty cool. So you get to be a DJ as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, I tried actually to be a DJ and I couldn't get the blending, the mixing right. But um, it's funny, my youngest brother is actually a professional DJ and musician and producer. So I kind of took the visual part of the creativity in our family and he took the audio. And we, so, so when I'm in St. Louis, he will DJ at clubs and I'll be behind him painting a big canvas live. Now you've done that quite a bit, right? Or Yeah. Through the years, some uh, videos of, of you doing that, and I know people were talking about that in the chat earlier as well. So that's that's kind of how that got started. Was was working with your brother? Were you doing that even before then? That started in in ninety seven. After I graduated from college, I moved to Arizona, and I met a bunch of DJs in Arizona that invited me to jump on stage and paint behind them. Uh, this guy named Z Trip, who's a super famous DJ, and his crew, and it kind of um. And then in 99, 98, 99, Scott Morse and I introduced these live art parties, the San Diego Comic-Con, where we would just get a bar in downtown San Diego in the gas lamp, 
get DJs in San Diego to host the night, and then we would show up. But we eventually were pulling guys on stage like David Mack, Ben Templesmith. I got Paul Pope to do live art with us out in New York at an wow. Africa Bambata concert in Manhattan one night. It was it was wild shit. Me, Paul Pope, and Mike Huddleston. Oh my! Painting on stage while Africa Bambata and the Soul Sonic Force performed. So. Um, Jason Sean Alexander, I got, you know, roped into this live art thing. And to the point, man, where Jason and I started doing collaborative paintings together to where he would start a piece and do his gorgeous mixed media, like figurative work. Mm -hmm. And then I would go in and kind of um, almost like deface the piece in a way where I would go around it or cross things out and, and you know it, it was it was like there's no rules like no no one can get upset about what the other guy does but there was something so fun and mischievous about getting to respond to what jason had done because mm -hmm. i got to feel like almost like basquiat or something and just go in and be like i'm just gonna go over somebody you know? <laughs> jason was never upset by anything i i did it was like and then people who are watching were like your guys' styles together actually merge really well because he's academic, but also loose and textural. And you're completely weird, psychedelic and, and like street arty or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's like academic meets punk or something. So it was, it was, it was fun, man. I mean, that kind of stuff is just, a blast. And I think it's important if you're an artist, whether you're a professional or not to make time to do things that are just playful and fun. Like we're not really making a living doing these collaborative paintings. We've sold a couple of them together, but this is just a fun thing we're doing at night in this nightclub. And then the next day, Jason goes to his studio to do his work. I go to my studio to do my work, but I've always had this thing where I, I still like to play. I still like to, draw on a sketchbook at night and not show anybody what I'm doing. It's just, um, it's just for me, you know, and I think that's important to still play and experiment, you know, mm -hmm. no, it's, uh, that's a, that's totally cool. I mean, I'd love to see, see one of those done in person. Uh, let's see a couple other things I saw here because the insidious monk did reply about what the title was that you did a did something for and it was female ninja so wanted to highlight okay, that, okay. that yeah. comment went by a long time ago um, what was the other one here I mean bootlegging is a habit mentioned that uh, you've done some great commissions for him two beastie boy album cover homages and a oh, yes, yes. rendition of legion for his extra yeah. sketchbook this yeah we uh, I, I hung out and chatted with him in uh, New York in October at New York Comic Con Thanks for the support, man. And uh, questions about the uh, Saturday Night Live cameo. Yes. The art. How did that all come about? So that's my buddy, Mike Diva, who directed Diva, yeah. the Girl Scouts uh, live action short. He called me in a panic a couple weeks ago, and he, he was directing a um, music video for SNL starring Pete Davidson called Short Ass Movies, mm -hmm. which went on to go viral. And he said, hey, Jim, man, um, the art team has all this art for us to hang up on the walls. It's all terrible. It looks like something you would get at Ikea. Can you send me today, like right now, can you send me a folder of images of stuff that we can choose from? So I just happened to be at home. I sent him all the stuff. They chose like 10 or 15 images. Sent, I sent them the high reses. They sent me the release form. And then, man, they printed these out and framed them and hung them on the set that night. Mike shot the video the next day. And then two days later, it was on SNL that night. Mm -hmm. We're talking like super fast turnaround. Um, but you can see my art in, in the background of the uh, short ass movies uh, music video. That's so cool. It's cool. man. I love when stuff like that happens. I love when it's like, not planned and i can actually um that's something i can hit my family up about like text my older sister and be like hey no big deal but my art's on snl tonight <laughs> and her response is like what what are you talking about i'm like just 
you know who Pete Davidson is? She's like, yeah. What? Wait for the Pete Davidson music video. She's like, okay. <laughs> because they like my family doesn't really know. Like they they I'll show them my comics and stuff, but they don't really know some of the stuff I do. But if I or the reach, it, right? I mean, most people think comics, yeah. so they just think it's in you know they think comic book shops and it's it kind of stops right there. So yeah. they, uh, you know, but we, I run into that all the time with people who uh, you know in the hobby with the same kind of feeling is that it can't branch out beyond that. But clearly you were, you know, with your approach to everything, you have been branching out beyond comics for a long time. So it's no small wonder that, that they would reach out, out to you, you know, because of whom you've been speaking with and at different times for them to, you know, ask you to, to supply the artwork for it. I mean, so it just makes sense. I mean, who, yeah. who knows where we're going to see your work, you know, in the next year, it could be something just, you know, as interesting as that, or even more unexpected. I mean, there's an advertising piece. I haven't shown any of your artwork. We've been talking, but maybe I should show that one, one piece that you sent me. Cause I, I just, I, I was expecting just to see all, uh, you know, artwork pieces. And then there was, uh, you know, this piece, oh, it, which, yeah. you know, this, this was, uh, for, uh, Tony and guy, the company that makes the bedhead, uh, mm -hmm hair products and this was a double page ad in nylon magazine and a couple other fashion magazines from years ago but i wound up doing this collaborative work with bedhead because a good buddy of mine worked at tony and guy so we did this and then we actually did two custom bottles of bedhead products with my artwork on it so this was like a big um just freelance advertising type gig you know which I like when stuff like this comes along, man, because it's it's so weird and like not what you would plan to do. But um, they let me do this weird stuff. I mean, there wasn't really any art directing. And so the creatures and everything, it's like they, they that's just what I turned in and that's what they printed. So pretty now, fun. something like this, did you work with the photographer at all or did they just supply you with the model photographs and you kind of worked? on the ones that you wanted? I mean, what kind of direction did they give you? My buddy who got me the gig is the photographer. So oh. uh, he, uh, Heath, a uh, good friend of mine. And so I actually got to sit in on the photo shoot and, um, you know, the, the one of the girl uh, on the right hand side standing um, with her boot up on the character that, that when, when Heath was taking those photos, that was one that I was like, okay, this is going to be great to draw around because I can have her actually standing on a character. There can be weird shapes and stuff going behind her. So I, I sort of saw how he was posing the girls knowing that, okay, I can draw around this stuff. I can add to this stuff, you know? Right. Well, you know, that was the one that I, when I looked at, it, I thought was kind of the coolest approach and why I was thinking you might've had some, you know, suggestions for it or, or whatnot, because of the way, you know, the, your character is wrapping around the, the photograph. It's just, it's just interesting. And it's, it's the, you know, it's a full figure piece. It's just really a, a fun kind of thing here. And I, I'm, I imagine while you were watching them take the photographs, you were, you were getting ideas for what you wanted to uh, eventually do with them. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was that was a fun one for sure. Let's see a comment from the audience. I would really love to see Jim's personal sketchbooks, but that really goes against the point of them. I don't know. Do you take uh, when when you're on the road or you're at a con? Do you, do you actually uh, you know take your own sketchbooks there to be working out things? That anybody ever ever looking over your shoulder while you're working in uh, in those? Uh, yeah, I've had that, but um, I mostly. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of keep some of that uh, under wraps, but I'll show you this book real quick. Uh, I actually sure. did um, Sadistic Magician through IDW. This volume came out a couple years ago, and it actually collects the best of my uh, sketchbook material. Oh, sweet. So I had my friend Carmen Acosta, who's a really fantastic designer, uh, she designed the book for me and, and put all these pages together and did some cool collage stuff with it. Uh, there's a quote from the master Bill Sienkiewicz on the back cover. Um, but yeah, so I actually wound up publishing some of what I think is some of the best of my sketchbook stuff, because when you are working in a way of not worrying about what people, people are not going to see this, mm -hmm. 
sometimes that creates the best stuff because you have no fear. You have no preconceived, like, I hope people like this. So there's been some happy accidents and some pieces in my sketchbooks that have turned out to be like, oh, I actually like that. Like, I think that that should be seen by people, you know? So, Mm -hmm. and there's been times where I will actually do something in my sketchbook, like it enough that I will scan it, blow it up, adjust the size of it and trace it and then turn it into an actual piece or a cover for a book or something where the pose was right or the composition was right. And then I just turn that into an actual full piece, you know? So that's the value again, man, of of the sketchbook work is you, you don't really know what's going to happen. And I love those happy accidents. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mel mentioned that. And I saw this as well on your website, the the pop-up book that you put together. How cool is that? <laughs> I have that here as well. Let me, I'll, uh, you should show that off because it, th- those were, those are pretty darn cool. So yeah. this was done with my buddy Ross, who also manages my website. Uh, he has a company called Popposition Press. And we did this as a, uh, crowd funded book on Kickstarter about a year ago. There's the droids, Tron, Daft Punk, and Star Wars. Um, but Ross figured out how to turn my my art into these 3D paper constructions. Oh man, that's that's great. And it's just it's it and th- and man, this pro- this this project was so perfect for crowdfunding. Like we we got the seal of approval from Kickstarter, and they wound up turning it into like one of their picks of the week, and so. We oh, got man. fully funded on our campaign in less than 48 hours. So like Ross and I were really excited about it. And we put a, a lot of work into figuring out how to make this work. Um, you can still get the pop-up book at uh, propositionpress.com. And Ross is currently expanding his brand. And he just got the license to do the Andy Warhol pop-up book. Oh, wow. So he's moved on from me and he's worked with like, Skinner, Junko Mizuno, Mike Giant, and now he's going after the big boys, um, Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and uh, the Warhol book. So, Ross, if you're watching, you better not forget the little people. (laughs) Hey, uh, let's see, Mikhail mentioned here, he said uh, you did that Killer Akira commission that I think you finished off as a print. Yes. Yeah. Was that one of the images you sent to me? Yeah, the uh, it's it's a uh, Canada on, on his bike. I have to, let me go through my slides here. They're much smaller, hard to hard to read in these tiny little thumbnails. Uh, where are you? Yes, are you? yes, there was a municipal waste reference, Samuel, with a uh, sadistic magician. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. As that's everybody knows, I have not seen Akira, and I'm 54 years old, and I've been shunned and shamed <laughs> by many oh. people when I let them know about that recently. So I've, I've got that on my list of things to, uh, to watch in the next few weeks. It's mind blowing, man. It, it, Akira is one of my favorite pop culture landmarks. I just think it works on every level and, uh, the manga, the original, like black and white Katsuhiro Tomo uh, manga is one of my favorite things in comics. So if you do watch the movie, Bill, make sure you also maybe check out the comics because the comics... I should probably do the comics first, right? It's, it's, it's so much more of an expanded universe, but it also works in this two-hour dose as the animated movie as well. So it's just well, cool did, stuff, man. I, I, asked just, my, I asked my wife about it because you know I remember her telling me she'd seen it in the theater because uh, she's a little older than I am. But she, she said she didn't like it. She didn't like it as uh, you know in the theater. But okay. didn't have a ref- point of reference in the uh, uh, in the book, so so I kind of thought I'd be better off starting with the books and then then move to just see what it was like when it was on the big screen. Yeah, my recommendation would be do the books first, and mm-hmm. then you, when you see the animated movie, you'll be like, "Oh, interesting. Okay, they compress this into this thing." But the interesting thing is, um, Atomo made the movie before he finished the Akira comic series okay so 
he adapted his own work, but then he had an ending to the story that fit the movie. But the comic is much more epic. In scale. All right. All right. Then I'm going to start there. Start there for sure. Yeah. All right. No, nope. I'm sold now. That's the okay, way. Cool. That's the approach to take. Um, let's see. I want to. I don't want to miss any comments here before we start looking at some more art. But uh, uh, where was it? Oh, how did uh, your relationship with Cam get started over at Inky Knuckles? Oh That's yeah. Um, my buddy Troy Nixie started working with Cam mm -hmm. and had great things to say about him. And um, I just approached Cam about representing me and and figuring out a, a deal that would work for both of us and. He's an extremely nice guy, very professional. The Inky Knuckles label and the artist he's curated, I feel like skews more toward, um, I don't want to say indie artists, but more like eclectic styles Yeah, is what I would say. And so I felt like with Troy and Matt Allison working with Cam, I felt like my aesthetic fit nicely with with that brand and uh really man he's just super easy to work with like like he's professional and we've never we've never had any issues or anything so um that being said i do want to announce that next tuesday a week from today on june 7th we're doing an art drop of a bunch of originals of mine on cam's website so inkyknuckles.com and then Cam and I will both be at Heroes Con next month set up and I'll be selling books and prints and he'll be selling original art of mine. So you know that the that. Heroes Con is going to be the biggest uh, art collector event of the year, right? So, yes. So you're going to the right show. Yes. <laughs> We're all going to be there. Uh, awesome. Okay, good. And man, I love Heroes because for me, it's like... Um, the show itself is great, but it's also like one of the best homey hangout shows where you literally see all your fellow brethren in comics and sisters in comics. You know, it's it's just a, like just knowing that like, OK, Scotty Young's going to be there. All the essential sequential guys are going to be there. Tommy Lee Edwards, Sean Crystal, Dan Panoshin, like those are all like we all know each other. We're all friends. Mm -hmm. It's a small community. But at Heroes, you're guaranteed like every night you're going to be hanging out with with your buddies, you know. And it, I, I I like that a lot, man. And I need that because you know we we spend time alone doing our work. And you need to be able to get together with people in real life to be able to complain about deadlines <laughs> <laughs> you know? and the other stuff that you can't complain to your normal friends about. You know what I mean? Because like, if I complain to my friends, they were, will always be like, "Dude, you sit at home in sweatpants and draw all day." Right. Like, what? what could be better than that? You complain <laughs> about your job? They're like, "I work at whatever office building," or you know, and it. it so it's like you have to be able to hang out with other artists to relate to what. Yes, you, exactly. You know, no, I, I, I totally get. No, Heroes is great for that. Actually, I think Heroes was the first place i met uh tommy lee edwards love his artwork he's a so great good. guy too man he's he's huge i mean i, I love his painting he's just amazing he's so good. he did a variant cover for my latest girl scout series but it was all digital which is fine but i was like can i get that original he's like i gotta do it quick man sorry i gotta do it digital you know but <sighs> i'm sure you've seen his painted poster sized originals at oh yeah you know, it's it's mind blowing, man. I'm, I feel really fortunate with like the talent that I'm friends with. Uh, I feel like I'm friends with some of the best artists on the planet, basically. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, no, you've, uh, you're, you're a part of the club now. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's so cool. Um, what other question here? I mean, it probably isn't your say or now someone's Jim or Stanley wanted to know if uh, you ever plan on working with any big characters at DC or Marvel. Or is that even anything like ever, even on your radar, really? I mean, that you'd like to do? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's just the um, what the opportunity would be, what the who the writer would be. Um, I'm assuming they wouldn't necessarily let me write and draw. But um, I mean, I grew up collecting and being obsessed with Marvel and DC comics. So 
I'm still a huge Spider-Man and Batman fanatic. So anything in those realms, like anytime anyone asks for a Spider-Man or a Batman about drawing those characters. So um, if any editors are out there that need my brand of wackiness on those titles, <laughs> just feel free to contact me. You know? So you wouldn't, you, you, you're not, you, you would say yes to the right project. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame you. And so why don't we look at some Marcus? You sent me all, a lot of these, a lot of images that I haven't shown really a single one. And I, I apologize for that. I could have, but I was having too much. Oh, no, you're good, man. But uh, here, let's see. Um, you know, you could just maybe talk about the pieces. I mean, because I, I asked you just to kind of pick pieces that you thought would be fun to talk about tonight and exemplary of uh, some of the work that you're doing today. Yeah, this is just black ink on a watercolor paper, just a fun, weird, hot girl with robot kind of thing. We're actually selling this original through the art drop, through Inking Knuckles. Um, on the 7th? Excuse me? On the 7th? I believe so. Uh, if not during that drop, it'll be at hopefully Heroes Con. Um, mm-hmm. I sent Cam enough art that we're, we have like two or three art drops worth of stuff. So it's been a very productive last three years for me, Bill. And uh, I'm excited to let people have the opportunity to grab some of this stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm using real Zipatone on my... I was going to ask you about that too. Little, when I was so looking like, at the close-ups and stuff, yeah, let me switch over to full screen. So, you know, like a piece like this, that's actual hand-cut zip. That's so cool, man. As far as you know, introducing texture into the into the pieces that way. Yeah, that's, that's so slick. I love that hands-on feel of it. You know. So that you know, that's what's cool is that you know, because I've asked most creators that have come on here, you know, what their last couple of years were like. But your yours were pretty productive then, with the uh, even yeah. with COVID and the pandemic. Um, you, you I mean, I mean, most people were shut in anyway, but you stayed really productive and uh, I mean, to have enough work for three or four art drops and heroes. That's a lot of, a lot of work. Yeah, man. I, like I said, I made this six issue Girl Scout stone ghost series. Uh, I did some freelance stuff and then all of 2020, we worked on this animated pilot that did not happen. But I think me and the team, especially my writing partner, Kate, we dealt with, the fear and paranoia and uncertainty by just working. I mean, I, 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 not to get psychological about it, but I think we are kind of in denial too. Like we don't know what is happening. Like we're, let's just make stuff. Like let's just make things and be creative. And cause you know, I mean, none, none of us knew what the hell was going on. So. All right. I don't know. Uh, I, I, we all, I, I remember it just, you know, as well as you do. Yeah. We all, yeah. we all started thinking early on, you know, we were going to, it was going to be over by the fall. New York comic con was going to happen. So it wasn't anything that anybody really prepared for. So, yeah. but, uh, but that's cool. I mean, that, that, you know, and then you're able to try to translate that. You, there's enough work there that, uh, you know, you're, you feel, you know, you want it out in the, out in the market, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So when you're at Heroes, are you going to be taking commissions? I mean, I, just out of curiosity, I'm sure some of the viewers here would like to know, or, you, or just more of a hangout, kind of relaxing time for you. I'm trying to figure that out because um, I'm, I've am i had this new approach with my table at conventions over the last couple of years. Like I did New York in October and then Emerald City in December. And I found that having a bunch of product and actually standing at the table is way more conducive to people coming over and interacting and I can let people know what I'm working on. Um, it's, it's bizarre, man, because like when you, when I run my own table. So when I'm at my own table and I'm sitting and my head's down and I'm drawing, working on commissions, it immediately cuts. You're immediately cutting yourself off almost from interacting. In mm-hmm. a way. So there's something I noticed dramatically about like, if I just stand all day and talk to people, like we're hanging out at my table, it it becomes way more of an interactive thing that I kind of enjoy. So um, that being said, I'll probably be doing quicker, cheaper 
smaller size commissions. Right. I was going to say, because it's standing isn't going to be very conducive to getting a lot of, uh, you know, bigger commissions done or that sort of thing. Yeah. So, but you know, that's really funny. When I went to, I, I went to MegaCon, so that was my first show that I went oh, back. Really? Right. I think most of the creators that I walked up to were standing, <laughs> which is funny, you know, but it, usually when somebody's sitting, it, you know, if, if, if you think they're working and they're a little bit, you don't want to necessarily approach them and, and interrupt something they're doing. I don't know if I really, if that's the psychology of that or not, but, but I, I know that I think at least 80% of the guys that I stepped up to, to talk to were already standing either, you know, looking out in the aisle to hope somebody would walk up to them or we're talking with somebody and standing. And I was like, and, th and they're just so more approachable. So yeah. you, yeah, you, you, you got that, you got that right. I would never have thought about it like that, but it makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's uh, there's something too about like, we sit, I think we, we sit all day drawing anyway. So when I travel or when I go out on the weekend with my friends and go to a bar, I sometimes am the guy that's like, why don't we just posse up at the bar and stand and have a drink? Cause like I've been sitting all day. I don't know about you guys, but I like, I'm okay with not sitting at the bar or outside on a picnic bench. Like I don't mind actually having a drink and just standing and conversing. Mm -hmm. It, it, you know, and so conventions, the last couple of shows, like I mentioned, I, I sort of tried this approach with uh, it's, it just makes things way more interactive, you know, which I enjoy, man. I enjoy people coming to my table and actually having conversations with me. And we're talking about the work. I'm showing them what we're doing, what I'm doing. And um, it's just like a it's a more balanced exchange than it feeling like. I'm at work at sitting at a table and these people don't want to maybe talk to me or something, it's, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. Well, uh, well, I look forward to getting to meet you guys over there. I mean, I, I've had Cam on the show before as well yeah. and, uh, but never met him in person. So that, that'll be pretty neat. I, I, that, that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to heroes. Cause there's so many people that I've gotten the chance to talk to over the last couple of years since I started doing these that I've never either spoken to at shows before or ever met before so heroes is just going to be a blast it's yeah. going it, to it's weird you know when you when you're meeting people that you've had an hour or two long conversations with them you know over one of these it's almost like you know you're friends already you know it's not like a first time you're meeting somebody I, I, an artist i did an art drop with uh i i saw him at at uh, megacon and it, and it was funny. I mean, I, it, it didn't click with him, but as soon as I saw him, I just like walked right up to him and started talking to him as if, as if and at first he looked at me and it didn't click who are, right. even though we were on screen like four months ago. Uh, and then he was like, Oh yeah, Bill, you know, but for me, I walked up just like, Hey, this, you know, it was like the conversation hadn't ended, you know, like, our, like we were yeah. the best friends. <laughs> That's cool though. I mean, that is one of the cool things that zoom brought to us over the last couple of years is like this instant, uh familiar familiarity with each other through okay well we can't hang out in person right now but we can still have this exchange we can have a conversation and we're talking about things that we're both passionate about you know like comics art pop culture it unites people immediately so you feel like you know people that way mm -hmm. it's an instant icebreaker and you know i, I like that Yep. No, I, I agree. Hey, let me uh, pull up the next piece of art here as well. Ah, yes. Yeah. Is this a recent one? Something that's coming up in a drop? This is an older piece. This is from 2013. It's dated uh, at the bottom by my signature. And it's this was just a mixed media experimental piece. Um, so ink, watercolor, there might be a colored pencil in there. Um, and this was the time where I was hanging out with Jason Sean Alexander a lot, which you can, you can tell, you can see some of the mixed media textural influence from Jason. Yeah. You know, I, I can definitely see what you mean. That's that. Yeah. This is a cool one. Or as Kavi just said, he, he says it's a cool one as well. Or, uh, Thank you. Here, yeah, thanks. What do we got here? Kavi's got a, several pieces of yours in his calf gallery. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, here's here's one of the more recent Batman commissions. So yeah, the the World Conqueror uh, Batman. I do like how you draw bats. 
Thank you. And you know, it, there's something so pure about just doing black and white, like black and white, throw a little zip of tone on top of it, make things pop, add a skull in there. And you've got like kind of a, <laughs> a heavy metal destroyer type Batman, you know, just real badass, real fun. And I can guarantee I was listening to like Mastodon or something while mm -hmm. I was drawing this, like some, you know, some metal, something with a bit of grit to it. And uh, just fun, man, like making that cape just flow and be become its own character and design element. Uh, but yeah, every artist, I think, loves drawing Batman. Oh, yeah. How can you not? Uh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> there was uh, one, uh, Rick mentioned this as, as well. Uh, when I did the interview last week with, with uh, Sean, he, he stood during the entire interview as well. Yes, so, <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Which I thought was, because I've got one of those standing desks and I've, I've done that from time to time as well, just because I either forget to lower it or whatnot. But, uh, but I, I, I kind of got the feeling that that was kind of his standard approach. You know, it was just he likes to stand most of the time, and yep. uh, they, they to each their own. I mean, it's a it, it works for him too. Yep, I have a standing desk that I will sometimes use when I'm writing. So it's on my computer. It's on my computer. My computer desk. Mm -hmm. This desk right here, and it's it's like I'll just switch back and forth. Um, I notice when I draw, though, I actually feel a bit more in control when I'm sitting. And I have the board, you know, at almost a 90 degree angle. So where I'm not like leaning in, but I'm, I'm drawing basically like this. And the board is like right here. Um, well, that's interesting. I, so you, so you work primarily vertically, I mean, with the art. I mean, almost, almost. It's, it's at an angle, but it's uh -huh. like pretty angled, like extreme angle, I would say. So sometimes I'm even taping the board to the, the table mm -hmm. so that it doesn't slide down. I've got clamps at the top of the table, but sometimes I'll just tape the piece of paper or whatever and just and I'm just working that Is that uh, because it's more comfortable for you that way or do you feel like you can view the overall artwork better rather than having it you know maybe I, at a 30 degree angle or something? I, mean, I think it's a better view and I also have noticed it's way less strain on my neck and shoulders. Mm -hmm. Cuz the more you can be back in this position instead of this like, cause I've been to chiropractors, man, over the years. And like, I got, this, I feel like I got to sit up straight right now myself. <laughs> just this slight, you know, my chiropractor was like, your head is a bowling ball on top of this spinal bone, your, your spinal, you know, you know, your, your, your spine. So he's like, that is so much weight for your spine to support. So if you're in a job or a position where you're like this every day, or even just this, that's so much pressure on your neck and shoulders. And over the last couple of years, like I, I've had instances where I've just felt like the tightness and cramping where I feel like I can't even like move my neck sometimes when it gets super tight. So I just had to introduce like stretching, getting a yoga ball and adjusting my drawing positions so that mm -hmm. I can try and avoid. Cause man, I mean, I've been, I've been drawing since I was a kid and I've been doing it as my job for 25 years. So you think about basically every day for eight hours a day, you're putting your body in this position. It's, it's not good for your body. No, so I agree. You know, I've been a desk for that long too. I know, I know what, I know what you mean. I go see a chiropractor regularly too. And they tell me the same thing, you know, you got to, that it's, it's all that posture at the desk and I still haven't learned. I, I try, I try. Yeah. Your but body I, I like that. I think it. that's cool. I don't think I've ever talked to a creator who uh, works, you know, other than painters, you know, who would normally have everything uh, in that position as well. But uh, more as an illustrator, you know, working in at that kind of an angle. But I think that's that's cool. And I think that it, you're right. It, it gives you a better view of what you're working on, uh, you know, a different kind of perspective on a piece than uh, than if it was, uh, you know, again, at a 30 degree angle or whatnot on a, t on a table. Just yep. seems it, it seems to make more sense if you've got the space and the and, and the, the right table to do that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. Let's look at some more art. We got uh, what do we got here? I got a color piece here. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this was a print that we did that we was one of the incentives for the pop up funk book for the Kickstarter, and this was just a fun bizarre 
psychedelic piece. I love drawing sharks. I love drawing attractive women with knives, I guess. And uh, <laughs> my, my friend, uh, my buddy, Justin Stewart actually wound up doing the colors on this one and really knocked it out of the park. Uh, Justin is someone I've collaborated with on and off again throughout the years. He colored the Girl Scouts Magic Socks comic series that came out in 2017. And um, just a good friend of mine, he helps run the Lexington Comic Con in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, All right. And he's just a great colorist, letterer, and designer. So he helped make this piece pop for sure. Yeah, no, the, the, the colors make it. I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, let's see. Here was a Electra piece. Yeah, this is a recent commission. Um, I wanted to pay a little homage to the Bill Sienkiewicz, Frank Miller, Electra Assassin miniseries from 86. So the top design element is Garrett and some of the various characters from Electra Assassin. And then the main image of Electra is just sort of like my interpretation of Electra, where I feel like I don't have to be completely faithful and loyal 100% to her costume or, you know, it's, it's the essence of Electra basically. That's well, uh it's a, it's damn nice, man. Thanks man. What, what size do you typically work on with, with pieces like this? What size? It's, usually, it's uh, usually 11 by 17. Okay. Um, that's the, the biggest I've gone on commissions. We also offer a, nine by 12 size, um, which actually that Batman black and white that you showed, that was just a nine by 12. Okay. Um, but, uh, I mean, I don't mind working bigger than 11 by 17. I don't have rules. It's just, it seems like most collectors like having traditional sizes just for their, uh, portfolios or their binders that they're displaying their work in. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it. Uh, I cr I think I crammed a lot into uh, eleven by seventeen on this one. No, you definitely did, and it's on uh, like a toned paper as well. Yes, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I like to experiment around with um, different tones of paper. That uh, this is a, like a page from recent Girl Scout series, and uh, it's on that kind of tan toned paper, so that. I'm doing everything in with black ink, obviously, but then I can go in with white, mm -hmm. white out paint and actually make things pop with white, add the gray zip uh, I did some of the blood effects with um, watercolor. And then I scan this and I'll add minimal color uh, in uh, Photoshop or Procreate and just, just to make things pop out a bit. Very nice. Let's, uh, what's the next piece here? This is, oh, this is the cover we were looking at earlier. Yeah. So this is the cover to the Girl Scout Stone Ghost trade paperback that's coming out next month, uh, June 22nd from Image Comics. So just a fun, like, kind of inspired by, like, Heavy Metal Magazine, just like a badass space girl, psychedelic background, uh, slight Kirby Crackle thing happening up there. Um, now for something then, like this, did you color it yourself or I did? Yeah. This, this one's all me, but you can see Bill, like, like my color palette when I color my own stuff is like super limited to, you know, there's only, there's like four colors basically. Uh, so I, I'm the piece for me has to work as a black and white image first. You know what I mean? So make, make everything pop have that real rich contrast with black and white, add the zip -a tone. Now you have a gray tone, add the white, which I did through white paint. And then as soon as I scan this image, all I'm really doing is adding the orange, yellow and gray and blue with digital. And then the piece is done. And uh, so, there's, there's Kirby Crackle in this one too, by the way. I saw that in the uh, Batman as did other people, but that's that's fun getting to see any of that. But but as far as a color palette goes, that's uh, you know that's 
in a weird way that's kind of limiting, but you do it really, really well. Yeah, I, I've told people I basically my approach to color is I use color basically as a design element. So I'm not really attempting to render or show volume and depth necessarily with color. I'm using it almost as like a flat design element to guide your eye over the piece and make certain things like pop. Um, so it's a very uh, almost like elementary primitive style to coloring, but it, it does work because it's, it's like I said, color as design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. It's kind of like that, like some of what was the old, like, uh, I don't know what where they would have been used. Old prints, where you're just using uh, like flat colors. Yep. Um, you know, from the 30s or 40s, and I can't even yeah, think of which, yeah. which genre or what was what that would have been for. But you you, you get what it, it kind of has that feel to it. But yep. that's cool. I mean, it's it's sort of crude, but it's it's it works. It's it, it um, like you said, it moves your eye around and at the same time achieves what you want. Because yeah, if I look at uh, the next piece here, let me see. That's uh, another cover and again oh, yeah. very limited yeah. on the palette here too yeah super simple but i mean from a design point of view it's giving you all the information you need in a very very short amount of time and this piece also was designed specifically for social media and people viewing it on instagram as much as i hate to say this like people are now viewing images just on Instagram and on their phone. So I've gotten to the point where I'm starting to make covers and teaser promo images based around the idea that this has to read at the size of someone's phone, um, which is sort of a crazy thing to think about, but that is kind of the world we live in right now. So as I was drawing this piece and coloring it, I kept importing it into my iPhone and looking it at it on my phone screen to make sure that it all read. So it's crazy, but it, that's just kind of where things are at right now. So. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm still adjusting. I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a big Instagram user yet, although everybody keeps telling me I should be, but, but you have to, if you're going to be using your work and marketing at all, you really have to think of it in those terms. I mean, at least it's part of what you're producing is going to be used in that way. You know, we were trying to repurpose some uh, videos for TikTok and stuff like that for clips from, you know, some of the selling shows that we've done. And oh, right. it's tough because, you, you know, you, it's, always, it's like going back and reworking something you already did and then doing it again just so you can figure a way to wedge it into that social, uh, you know, marketing opportunity channel. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. You got to put a lot of effort out there if you're going to kind of, yes. uh, you know, do all that sort of thing, or at least approach, especially if you're having to look at your work to begin with, and then know that you're going to have to kind of format it one way or another to, to fit this other platform to, to allow you to properly market things over there. Yeah. It's changed the way people approach things. And I mean, Instagram, since it is a visual, I view it as like being a visual thing first. Like I have gained a whole new audience just from having an Instagram account over the last couple of years, just because that's where people go to discover new art and discover everything. So it, it has worked to my advantage, man, where I, I've had like a whole new fan base basically from posting. I post almost every day uh, consecutively and it's, mm -hmm. it could be old stuff, new stuff, but I basically do that just to remind the world, like, Hey, I'm an artist and I'm making art. And here's another daily reminder of me doing art. Even if you look at this for just two seconds in the morning, when you're scrolling through, you still know in your mind, Oh yeah, Jim's out there doing art. Oh, that's cool. You know, but it's like that five seconds that they're spending with it. It's so, it's very disposable in a way it's weird, but the, the fans that I've made from that, that really want my work, they're the ones that will then go out and buy the comic book when it comes out in the comic shop or order right. something from my website or come to my table at a show and buy some art. So you never know what you're going to get. So I always figure like, it doesn't hurt to put this stuff up there, you know? No, no, it doesn't. And, you know, the thing that always got me with Instagram is, you know, you can't put links in anything. It's like, well, it's a, it's a marketing platform without links. And I, and it took me, the, I, I mean, I get it now, but early on I was like, that's just stupid. 
if, yeah. I, if I can't bring them over to my whatever, if I'm trying to get them to my YouTube page or I'm trying to bring them over to comic art fans, you know, it's like I, I was featuring art over there uh, that I'd like on CAF. And then I'd be like, well, I can't link to it now. It just seems so counterproductive. I mean, but I get it now. I mean, I, but at, early on when I was trying to figure out how to use it, I, I was just like, this is it's just stupid. You know, yes. It's not, it's, but I, it, I look back at it now. It's like if I would have been doing more of that, I can only imagine where I'd be today. You know, with certain things, whether it's uh, just promoting calf and uh, collectors collections on calf or artists who are posting on calf, um, it, you know, if I would have been doing that five years ago, you know, I think I'd be so much further ahead than uh, than where I'm at now. Now it's all just playing catch up and then trying to trying to capture the you know the eyeballs that are already you know gravitated towards to, towards your feet or whatever. But things on a timeline are really. I, you know, you just never know which which one of those people will turn into a to a customer. I mean, we've been, yep. been I, 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 so one thing I appreciate about Facebook is I do discover a lot of things when I'm scrolling through it because uh, I, you know, I'll scroll through my timeline all the time. But I'll, there's lots of things that I'll stop on and go and look at. So I get it. You know, we've always talked about putting some kind of a timeline sort of a thing on CAF just to, you know for discovery purposes. So it'll right. you know tailor it in after things you already appreciate, but try to wedge in a few new things at the same time just to you never know what what you might discover as a collector on the site with that kind of an experience so it's uh it's been a, it's been on my to-do list for a long time oh definitely <laughs> yeah I, I get it i see it now there's a lot of power in that yeah it's just it's crazy too man because it's like not only do you have to start your own thing whatever you're doing if you're an artist or you're selling art or whatever you're doing you have to have the social media presence and the time and wherewithal to manage that on top of actually making the art or running your business, whatever you're doing, there's all these things that have, have to happen simultaneously with that now. And it becomes a lot. I try not to overthink it or let it stress me out. It just, it just becomes, like I said, more of a daily routine of in the morning, I post my art on Instagram. It links to my Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. When I have a new product, new project coming out, whatever, I promote it on the, all those social medias. And then I try and do appearances and do conventions to meet people in person to let them know. But you don't want it to like ruin your life or stress you out. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, yeah. I definitely know what you mean. <laughs> it becomes a lot. Let's see here. Why don't we look at a few more things here? Oh, yeah. yeah this uh, is uh, from 21. It looks like it's a date. Yes. This was um, Lady Snowblood commission that I did uh, through Inky Knuckles. So this was a fun one. I mean, I definitely took lots of liberties with this because I just made it as ultra sexy <laughs> as I could. Um, this one is, you know, I used photo reference for the for the female, for the pose and everything and then just kind of added my own ingredients into it and um zip -it tone and the real minimal just you know the red watercolor blood splatter and the white paint and that's sort of all you need you know this was a yeah no no it's uh what and you have pointy things in here again you like the knives and yes <laughs> Yeah. I also love drawing hair. I love drawing, especially on female characters, like having the hair as another almost sensual element that becomes part of the design where you can play with the shape of the hair, the waviness of it. It just, I don't know. It sounds weird, but it, it, it becomes almost like its own design element as well. And when you work with the zip tone on something like this, I mean, do you agonize over the placement? Do you just kind of, you cut the shape and then lay it down and you don't really care? I mean, do you, do you sometimes put it down and then have to lift it off because it what, didn't get the effect that you were hoping it was going to get? I try not to be too precious with it. If it's off registration, which you can see in her hair, it's mm -hmm. going beyond the black ink line. That's okay to me. You know, I, I don't mind the raw almost um you mentioned screen printing before and i almost like the idea of certain things being off registration you know with with the zip -a tone especially it, it i think it gives um character to the piece and uh 
it also just makes it, it's like, it doesn't have to be so precious that you're making it literally fit into every line and shape, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that was kind of what I was hoping to hear, you know, that, that that's your approach to it. You're not worried about it being perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, my approach to color is kind of the same way too, where it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be so literal that every shape is filled in perfectly. And, you know, it, there's a shorthand to a lot of visual stuff, uh, as I'm sure, you know, where you mm -hmm. pick up tricks after a while, where you know what registers with people's eye, you know, like the eye is going to know what this shape is. The eye is going to know where something starts and begins and ends. And, you know, so I, I try and uh, assume that the viewer is not a complete idiot. You know what I mean? I just, no, no, I, I totally get it. I think that the fa fandom now and art collectors now, I think are more educated and experienced on what they're looking at and what is available and what art styles are. And, you know, I don't know, man, like 10 or 15 years ago at conventions, I would just get people that were like, just didn't seem like they knew what I was doing at all. Like it was so shocking to them to see a non-conventional drawing style. And now I think social media has kind of helped with this. I think that people are opening up to the idea of like comics doesn't have to look a certain way. Batman can be drawn in a different way than just the mm -hmm. traditional cookie cutter, you know, you know, so I, I think things are kind of evolving into uh, more play, more experimentation, emphasis on more individualized styles. You know, when I see guys like Trad Moore becoming very popular, I love his work. I think he's completely bugged out and original and awesome. But the fact that he's getting to do Marvel books, to me, like, that's a good sign. Like, okay, there's a demand for this. There's a demand for people that are willing to break out of the mold, you know? And I, I personally think comics needs way more of that still. I mean, hopefully it's coming, but uh, Trad and that school of guys like, you know, Daniel Warren and James Heron and, Ian Bertram, like that school of guys, like I love what they do. And I love that they're kind of carving their own path with um, these interesting, really brilliant styles, you know? Right. Well, I think art collecting has evolved a lot in the last 20 years and art collectors have as well. And I'm always, you know, I feel like I'm the the neophyte in, in the art collecting world as far as appreciating the arts as much as many other collectors do. You know, that's the one thing I, my biggest takeaway from the last couple of years <clears throat> is just that, uh, you know, I, I find collectors are really, you know, they're concerned about the art and they want creative approaches to uh, whether it's uh, characters they're familiar with or characters they're not in the comics that they're reading and the art that they're buying. And it wasn't really like that 20 years ago, at least not in the circles yeah. that I was hanging out with. But I, I do feel that, you know, we, we've brought in a younger group of collectors and definitely in the last 10 years and, and they, and they really do, kind of demand that i mean they they want they want something different you know they want something that feels more uh generational to them as well and i think that that's why we're getting to see more and more artists come out and get get uh, larger name books you know and people are willing to take those chances chances with them because i think that the, you know some of the editors and the publishers realize that's really what uh the, you know that younger audience is really looking for you yeah know, people that stand out from the from the crowd i mean and there's nothing wrong with you know, uh, my heroes of old, right? I mean, I, you know, oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I think that that's, that's a really important part and you have to have some level, some percentage of your, the books that you're putting out or the work that the product that you're putting out, it needs to have that, 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 that interesting edge to it that, um, that we didn't have 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's how you propel the medium and the art form and, um, it's interesting because like, I think I'm assuming most of the editors at Marvel and DC now are probably younger than me. You know, there's editors that right. are in their twenties, obviously twenties, thirties, I'm in my forties. So it's like, Oh, the kids making the decisions to what creative teams go on these books are younger than some of the talent they're hiring. So and it almost worked at Disney. 
it almost worked. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> those young guys, they um, almost they could have almost produced something really cool, but the those old stodgier guys decided we're not having any of that. Not yet. Maybe yeah. another 10 years. You know, it's interesting though, those young, cool executives we are working with, if they move on to a different company or go on to a position of big power at some point. Those are the people that hopefully will remember, like you yeah. said, and, and just and be like, "Hey, it didn't work out in 2020, but why don't we try and do something now that I'm in the position of actually making mm -hmm. things happen?" You know, who knows? Oh man, let's see. Here, uh, oh, here we yeah. go. This was a, a variant cover for a book called Mudafukas out of France. And they're doing, um, Behemoth Comics is doing an English adaptation of it. And this was a variant cover I did for the first issue. Really, really fun piece to do. Um, I'm selling the original of this through Cam. That'll either be through the art drop next week or at Heroes. But uh, super fun, really bizarre characters, as you can tell. Uh, there's also an animated, there's an anime movie of this on Netflix that Studio 4C out of Japan huh. put together. That's really, really cool. Under the same name? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, um, it's um, on Netflix. They didn't call it Mudafuckas. They called it MFKZ. MFKZ. <laughs> yeah, I guess you All can't right. have the word F-U-K-A-Z, fuckas, in, on Netflix. but No. Uh, uh, those parental filters should, could have kept it out of kids' uh, feeds, but oh, you know, oh well. But okay, right. MFKZ. I'll look that up. It's really cool, man. It's 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 real good stuff. Um, and this was just a fun one to do. I mean, you could tell like the formula I was talking about before is kind of the same here with just real minimal color, color as a design element, circles and shapes as design and just uh playing with uh the forms and and high contrast black and white kinetic line energy and uh making something hopefully exciting to look at so for something like this do you do a lot of preliminary work or do you just dive right into it with a with a vision and then just kind of work your way through it i, I definitely did some sketches on this one i mean i knew i wanted like the main character, I can't remember his name, but he's the big, just circular face right there in the lower left side. I knew that I wanted to, you know, have an emphasis on him and fit in the skull guy and the main hot girl. And then everything around that is just is just kind of like design window dressing. But figuring out the three of them was something I, I focused on in the layout. Uh, and then adding the roaches and some of the stuff that comes as i'm actually working on the piece where it's kind of like oh hey maybe something down here will work maybe something up here will work um well you keep a really free you know style or, or feeling to your to your work right i mean it it feels as if it's very spontaneous and that's what i think is you know and all the pieces we've looked at tonight and you know any works that you can see on your site and whatnot it has that feeling like you're really just doing this right, you know, freehand. You're not even worrying about what that there were prelims or things that kind of forced you into a particular structure here. It just feels like the art just flows right out, you know, off the pen. And that's that's one of the things that you know I really appreciate most about your work is that it has that feeling. So that's why I, you know that was one of I had, I, had, I didn't have many questions, but that was one of them that I wanted to ask you know, as far as the prelims go. Oh sure. Thanks for the compliment too. But yeah, I, it's funny, man, like every piece is sort of different for me. So sometimes my design and layout preliminary phase is different varying uh, on what I'm working on. Sometimes I sort of just know what I want to do and I go for it. Sometimes I really have to work it out beforehand. And sometimes I'll have a photo reference where the photo will kind of tell me what the piece is going to be, if it's a really great pose for a character, I'll kind of make that the center or the focus of the piece, like the Lady Snowbird image you showed, Lady Snowblood, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, 
And, and I kind of build the rest of the piece around that photo reference, you know? Sure. Um, so, yeah. So there are elements to a lot of these that is spontaneous, like the cockroaches yeah. or what? Yeah. It just, it just fits. After yeah. you kind of get the, the base form, say where you want them. That, all right. That's, but that's what yeah. it feels like, you know, like when you're drawing the hair or you're drawing this like flaming shape that's coming through, you know, it, it feels like it's was just spontaneous and you're like, that would be cool to put that right yes. there. Yeah. Sometimes that comes back though and bites me on the ass. Like if it doesn't work out, I have to be like, okay, do I break out the light table and trace this and redo it? Or, I mean, sometimes that happens. Sometimes spontaneity or, not planning things comes back to bite you in the ass. So it's you're making all... an argument for digital art here, Jim, and I know you're not, but you know what I mean? That's, yeah, that's... Well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to digital. A lot of friends of mine have converted to digital. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still an ink on paper guy, but I did just buy the brand new iPad pro, the 12 inch, and I'm doing coloring now on, um, in procreate. Mm hmm with the Apple pencil directly on the screen, man, is so it's awesome. I can't deny it. It's really cool. But that being said, I still have to have my ink tools on paper to, I can draw digitally, but it doesn't, I'm, I don't get like the same line or the same grit and texture that I get with the traditional tools on paper, you know? And plus obvious thing to say, especially on this show, I want to have the original art. I want mm -hmm. to have original art to sell. It 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 is a supplement to my in income as a freelancer. And so the guys that go digital, it's like you're not you're losing out on all that original art. And their argument would be that maybe they can do two books books a month versus one or you know because they can be quicker and and, and or or maybe uh, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, I've read where the artists just they want to have more time with family, so they feel they can get done faster, and that's that's their priority, and they're not worried about the extra income. And, and there, there's always an argument either way. Um, but you know, f for the audience that's watching the show tonight, uh, you know, we're, we all we love hearing it when you say, you know, you need that traditional approach to your work because it's that's what really captures uh, what you're you're after. And yeah. at the end of the day, we, you know, we're the consumers of that. We, you know, we, we want to be able to have you continuing to do tr traditional work. Yeah. And also, man, being like being at conventions or having a gallery show and actually having the public be able to see your originals and see all the work that goes into it, see it at 11 by 17 size, as opposed to the size of a small little comic book when it gets mm -hmm. printed, it makes an impact on people. Like I've had people stop in their tracks as they pass my table and they see my portfolio and they start flipping through it and they're like oh wow wow the originals are it looks great oh, oh shit you're actually hand cutting zipatone and then they start asking me questions how did you do this what is this mm -hmm. is this watercolor what and then you start having this dialogue with people about technique and approach and it kind of adds and builds to the credibility of what you're doing you know, and I mean, it. there is something, man, about being able to pull this off on paper and not have the delete button. Usually, <laughs> and here's the thing I'll say real sure. quick, too. Hanging out with Jason, Sean, Alexander, becoming really good friends with him. When he started going digital, I was horrified and started talking so much shit to him because him and I are <laughs> analog guys. I mean, he's a brilliant, fine artist as well. He can paint. He can do you saw the paintings he showed him mm -hmm. on your show. They're incredible. The reason he did this, and I completely understand it now, he started making monthly comics. So any friend who says, I'm going digital so I can do monthly comics, I completely understand that. I'm not going to talk shit on that. But that being said, I still want to know, like, you got to do painted covers, though. You got to do the occasional original. Like, I still want to see Jason's work on paper. Right. You know, so, so and I, he, he will keep that as part of his repertoire, what he does, but um, there is something uh, empowering about knowing, Hey, I pulled this image off without the delete key, man. Mm -hmm. I pulled this off on paper. There might've been a couple of little areas of whiteout, but this is, you know, there's something proud about it. There there's, 
And then that that piece, that's what I think adds value to a piece of original art is this is the original. This is what the guy made. Like this is look at what is happening on this canvas or piece of paper or whatever. It's it's you know, it, it um it's 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 one hundred percent the artist's intention in physical form. So that matters to me, you know. So here's a question for you, because Jason had a lot of uh, some of his favorite pieces he still owns. Do you are you as attached to uh, a lot of your your pieces as well? I mean, or what's your you know, do you have artworks that you've done and you're like, I'm never going to sell that piece? Or, or do you have less of an attachment to the work after you're done with it? Uh, I've kept some of the originals that mean a lot to me. Um, this like this tank girl image I did for the cover of the tank girl book I worked on. Yeah. This is one of the most viral images that I've produced in my career. Uh, there's prints of it. There was bootleg t-shirts of it. And I kept the original of that. I mean, I probably won't ever sell it. it it's something that means a lot to me getting be able to be able to work on the tank girl character and having that be the official art for the cover of the first book I did. Right. Uh, a lot of the Girl Scouts covers I still own. Um, some of the Spider-Man stuff covers I own. I sold every piece of Clerk's original art to Kevin Smith. So that was kind of one That's of the- a good home then. <laughs> that was one of the sweet deals of working with him in the beginning. I don't know if he's still the same way now, but if you worked with Kevin, you basically got paid twice because you get paid to draw the book. And then- he would call you when the book's done and just be like, what do you want? I want all of it. What do you want? I want the sketches. I want the t-shirt design. I want all the interior pages. Hit me with a figure and we would negotiate a price, but it was cool knowing that the creator, like he, he owns all, all right. Stuff. Well, it's, it's just like you were talking when you're, and when other people are drawing your, uh, Girl Scouts or whatnot, you know, you want to be able to own those originals or negotiate how to, you know, get them as well. It's, it's, it's the same for him. I mean, anybody who's creating something is in a real unique position. And then when other people kind of dabble in their universe, uh, it's exciting. You know, yeah. it really is. I mean, at, at that moment, you know that, you know, especially when, when it's your peers, when it's for people who or people that you really look up to, like you were talking like Bill, Bill Sienkiewicz is working, you know, growing up, who would have thought that, you know, you'd have the opportunity to have oh. Bill Sienkiewicz be, be someone who not only admires your work, but is doing work for you. I mean, it's yeah. just so damn cool, man. Yeah. It's a mind blowing moment becoming friends with him. And he calls me and Jason, his uh, little brothers. He's like, you guys are carrying on the lineage of like <clears throat> what me and, George Pratt and Kent Williams kind of started this mm -hmm. weird mixed media kind of approach. And uh, Bill and I are both huge Ralph Steadman fans, sure. obviously. And he's like, you've taken the gonzo approach with your work of this just free, splattery, don't give a shit type attitude. He's like, I know you give a shit, but there's images of yours that just seem like you're just straight going for it. You're just drawing straight in ink. And he's like, I, I've done pieces like that. There's something very freeing about that, you know? And uh, that being said, I asked him, I was like, do you ever, do you still make mistakes? Like, do you, do you ruin a piece? Like, have you ever, and he's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like it, he told me it's still sometimes a struggle in studio. He's like, it's mm -hmm. all, it's a challenge. It's, Making art isn't easy. Making a good cover isn't easy. It's all decision making, planning, design, color, theory. You know, so hearing the master say that he still messes up, like those are the questions I want to know with my favorite creators. Like, you seem like a invulnerable god to me. Do you screw up? Do you? tear up a piece in rage and throw it away and have to start from scratch. And the thing I've discovered is most creators say yes, still. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's like really reassuring to me. Uh, knowing that no one ever completely has this figured out, you know? Yeah, no. And, and there's gotta be a lot of pressure. I mean, Bill can't put bad work out there. And if he sees something, a flaw that he doesn't like, I mean, uh, 
yeah, he, he's is he, well. That, but that's how you kind of curate your brand in its own way, right? I mean, you're it you're is. not going to let something bad go out as well, right? So if you have to throw it out and start over, you it's it's better to throw it out and and give it another try because you're probably going to you're it's probably going to come out better. You've got a second approach to it, and uh, you're not going to screw it up. So nobody gets to know that you had to, had to throw one out to get to where you're at. Right. Yeah, some commissions I've done, I've had to like restart three or four times just because. I have this, I have the client in my mind as I'm doing a piece for them, even if I don't know them. And I want to make this person happy who spent good money on my art. And so sometimes the pressure of that, you can almost psych yourself out in a way. And, and then I kind of have to have a conversation with myself where I say, no, they paid for you to be you. They paid for your work. They know what they're getting try not to think about them and be you and do your version of Batman or Electra or like, do you, they want you or else they wouldn't have commissioned you. Right. So I, but I sometimes have to remind myself by having that conversation in my head of just do you, man. Like that's what you're getting hired to do. So. Sure. I mean, and like in back in the day, you know, maybe they were giving us a, a sketchbook to work in or whatever. And you could see other works that were done today. It's like, you can go to their calf gallery and see other commissions maybe they've done. And, uh, but that's good though. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, it, you can kind of get a feel for what you think their expectations are and maybe what the bar is set for yourself, you know, and, and it, cause you know, you know, with, with whatever the level of commission go, uh, is that you're getting, um, I don't know, but that's cool that you actually, you know, you're, you're concerned, you know, and and that's, you know, I think about calf and, and all that, as far as like its contribution to the hobby has allowed uh, artists to then know, you know, the collectors who are part of the hobby, that, what they're collecting. And, and in some weird ways, <clears throat> you know, I've talked to a few artists in the past who've said, I know, I knew I got, I knew I kind of made it when, when this collector had some of my artwork in their collection. Oh, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And, yep. and I think that that's, you know, I, I didn't build calf for, for that as a purpose, but I, th I look at it now and I think that that's, it's, it kind of, it's done that. It's made people aware of uh, we as collectors as personalities within the ecosystem that makes up original art collecting and, and original art creation too, because um, I don't know, it's just, it's, I dig calf more and more every day when I think about the, the little nuances and the things that it's added to the hobby. So but but I, I I think that's really great that you actually you know you're concerned you know this collector is is commissioned you for something and you don't want to disappoint because you're familiar with them in one way or another you've seen them at shows um, you know or oh yeah yeah that so that that's totally cool it's a it's a fairly small community I mean I I mean you know this too man it's just just comics itself is a small community so after 25 years I mean I've met. Uh, like most people that work in comics mm -hmm. from writers to artists to editors. It's like, you just cross paths and that can be a great thing, but it can also be like, well, if you're an idiot, people are going to find out people are going to talk about you. And it's, so don't it's be an true. idiot. Is what I'm saying to all <laughs> aspiring artists out there, be make deadlines. Don't be an, a rude asshole and, you know, do your best. And I think things will it's work. It's tough sometimes. You know, you grow when you're young and you're growing and you want to be an artist. I mean, sometimes people feel like the approach to being an artist is to be, you know, have, be rough around the edges or whatnot, but in, 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 it really isn't. I mean, at the end of the day, be as personable as possible. It usually yeah. is the, you know, you're going to go further in business. Um, and, and then the relationships you make with collectors afterwards. And it's, I've, I've, I've had some artists that use CAF, you know, that I've had, had discussions with that just don't get that, you know, they don't understand and they kind of come at it from a different angle. And, and those are all, it's always tough. You, you end up not wanting to talk to them. And that's exactly what, as a, as somebody who's trying to start a career and be self-employed and, and, and hope to ascend the ranks that, you know, that they'd like to get to the, you know, personality and their approach to business and their approach to just conversation is, uh, is so important to, uh, yep. to one's success. And skill is, skill is only going to get you so far, you know, you gotta be able to make, make good relationships and certainly make good decisions on things. So, um, yeah, so I hope any creators who are watching this, aspiring artists, should should always keep that in mind because you're because like you just said, the the hobby isn't that. I mean, as far as like art collectors, it's not huge, and then in, within the business itself, it's even smaller. So you really got to maintain a great really uh, you know reputation. You want to deliver on time, like you've, your approach to doing your comics, all that. You know, that's how you've established 
your you know your reputation in the business side of things and then uh, clearly your concern with the commissions as well so yeah it's it's everything it all kind of all blends into each other you know and even like a, a thing that never existed before man was uh, fans having such immediate um accessibility to creators and like i get younger uh amateur artists dming me on instagram almost every day with like questions about how to break in how do you approach this how do you do that and i try and answer those as much as i can but even at the end of the day it's like my work day's done my brain's fried my eyes are kind of sore from drawing all day do i get on ig now and answer dms <laughs> <laughs> so I just sit on the couch and like watch a movie um, because I, I definitely want to, if I can inspire young artists, like that's awesome. I want to do that. But that job did not even exist a, a couple of years ago of mm -hmm. this immediate accessibility. When I was a kid, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like I didn't have ex access to any comic creators. I mean, unless you waited in line at a convention to talk to someone, like if you worked up, worked up the nerve to talk to like Neil Adams or someone, you, you know, it, it was, um, uh, could be a nerve wracking experience. And now it's like any kid can just follow you and then send you a, a, a DM and be like, can, can you help me out? Oh yeah. My first experience going up to an artist was uh, Walt Simonson. I was, oh, I was yeah, probably yeah. like 12 or 13. So it was around 1980, 81 or so. And, uh, I remember asking him for a sketch and he was just like, nah, can't do it for you, kid. And so it's like, it's funny. That would have been my first art buy, you know, but that was, yeah. but, but like you said, it was, you know, today kids can follow you and, you know, and, and kind of get to know you. But I didn't know Walt Simonson from anybody other than the work that he had done. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that, that one moment, like reshaped the next 12 years. Cause I didn't, you know, I, I don't, I, I never thought about buying original art for a very long time after oh, being told no one time, you know? But uh, but but it, just thinking about that, like you just said, it's the world is so different today as far as being, anybody can DM you and looking for advice. Whereas before that, I mean, nobody could uh, you, you couldn't ask Walt Simonson questions unless you were sending letters into the Marvel offices. Right. Like that. Right. And is he really even going to see those? Yeah. It's funny. When I was doing my DIY self-published stuff in college, I would actually mail out copies of it to various publishers like Fantagraphics, Slave Labor. Mm -hmm. And I even mailed stuff to like Dan Klaus, Evan Dorkin. And Dan and Evan actually both took the time to write me and mail me a letter back. And uh, Dan was just like, hey man, your stuff's good. Keep at it. Hopefully you break in. Good luck. Evan would actually write me like multiple page critiques of what I was doing. And I thanked him for this later when I finally met him, but you know, in a pre-internet era, I'm like, man, you actually took the time to hand write me letters saying you're on the right path. Your stuff's good, but your lettering sucks. Try this uh, pen for lettering, do this for panel borders, do like very specific kind of um, uh, teaching aspects that he decided like this kid shows promise. So I guess I'll write him. And try and get him on the right path because he's close, but he's still being an idiot about certain things. <laughs> so, I mean, that really kind of formed this friendship between the two of us where when I see him to this day at shows, I, I like Shrek, I'll bring it up to him and be like, dude, you took the time to write me when I was 20 years old and an idiot and didn't know what I was doing. It's something I won't ever forget. You know, it made a big impression on me. And I... Well, see, that's why you have that, that little bit of angst about re uh, replying to those <laughs> yeah. DMs today because yeah. you, you, you're you trying to pay it forward when you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't want to ruin someone's dream by not responding to them. <laughs> you know, but, uh, well, you can't reply to them all. I mean, there's only right, so right. many hours in the day. Yeah, it. Uh, I think people, I hope that people know that, that people know my life's crazy, busy, hectic. Your life is crazy, busy, hectic. Like, oh, if you don't hear a response, um, we'll, we'll try again at some point. But uh, right, well, there's only so many things you can do. I mean, I yeah, I yeah. get emails all the time about the site or about the hobby or things, and I don't, I can't reply to all of them. But 
but you, you still internalize it all. I mean, I feel like even when I, the ones that I don't get the chance to reply to, I'm always thinking about those things. If it's something that's negative about the site or whatever, you know, you, and, and then I hope that that comes out in a positive way. Like the next time I do something to make the site better or, or evolve the, the virtual con or that sort of thing. So, so I, I'm not always the most responsive person, but I, I, I take everything to heart, even when I hear yeah. it and I don't get a chance. And so hopefully in the end, like that person will see that, you know, well, maybe he did listen to me and that's why things change down here, down the road or whatnot. Or, um, you know, because I, I think that's important when you put yourself out there like this, you, you do have to, um, you at least got to read everything, right? I mean, yeah, at, at the very least, even sure. if you're not getting back to everybody. Yeah. It, uh, that being said, if you ask a stupid question, <laughs> don't expect that. I, I, won't, I won't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, there's been a few of those. I, everybody in the audience, every I've gotten a few dumb emails, and I'll and I'll read that. And I'll say, you know, I'll be like, I got this email the other day. I'm not going to reply to that. And I'll even say, I'm not going to reply to that one. And everybody's like, they understand why. It's like, yeah, there's just some that that, that don't don't warrant a reply. But yeah, for me, yeah. it's it's the thoughtful ones that bother me the most. You know, that you don't have the time for. But again, it's back to you know, you can only only do so much. But um, you know, we're actually at, oh, we're past the two hour mark, man. We've been talking forever. I never set timelines, yeah, obviously, yeah. but I always have a mental two hour uh, moment here. So this has been fun, Jim. I mean, I, I can't tell you, I am really looking forward to getting to see you in person at Hero. Yes. Cam, yeah. Cam as well. This is going to be, I'm going to be bringing, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like setting up a little bit of recording equipment that I'm going to bring with me. I'm hoping to do like little quick, like two to five minute quick interviews with everybody I can. Cool. While I'm there. So uh, if, if you don't mind, I mean, you'll be one of the people that I want to like at least get behind the table with and just chat for a few minutes. Yeah, please do. Come by, man. I'll I'll have a my own table, I think, in the indie area. Yeah, they have, yeah they've got a big indie section, right? The indie Island. So um, just seeing the lineup of talent that's going to be there, I'm so excited to get out and hang with everybody. And uh, it's funny because I actually haven't met Cam in person yet. So this will be the first time. Cause we started working together during the pandemic mm -hmm. and he's in Canada. So it's just crazy, man. It's like, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll be hanging out for the first time ever. I'll be meeting you obviously. And, uh, anybody yeah. watching, you know, please come through, say hi. And, uh, it should be great. Well, uh, again, there's at least, I bet you there's going to be 150 people from CAF or the channel who are going to be there, if not more. Awesome. That, uh, so it's going to be a it's going to be a good show. Good show for the creators. A good show for us as collectors to get to hang out. Um, like Mikhail just mentioned, there's a party on Thursday night. Like they're having a kickoff party for the con at this. Uh, it's a I don't have the name in front of me. I guess it's a Bari a Bari bar where they have a lot of vintage retro games and stuff. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, okay. So that should be fun. I mean, it's a uh, it's going to be mostly art collectors, I'd say. Probably, well, let's say half. I won't say it's all because I think they're selling like 250 tickets to it. But it's something that we had been talking about for quite some time as as a group wanting to do something. And uh, and local guy George Hodge, who's in one of the bands, also had a, kind of organized the whole get together. So it's going to be it's going to be nice. a good time. That's cool, man. Yeah, I'm excited to get out there. And uh, I also wanted to say thanks to the uh, the folks out there who bought originals from me from. Uh, the comic art live that that happened that was was that last weekend it was last weekend yeah yeah so i think did they go well because i'll be honest i didn't get to watch a lot of the sales that were happening but so it went good all right that, that's what i want to hear i mean yeah 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 i sold some stuff so who, if you guys are on the board right now watching uh thank you thank you for the support and uh also bill thanks for having me man this was this was great no, Jim. I, well, and, and I had to thank Mel once again. Mel's been Mel was yes. reaching out to a lot of people for me. Thank you, Mel. Me. Yeah, I, I I need the help. It's like for me, I'm always grabbing the the low hanging fruit. Somebody emailing me saying, "Hey, I'd like to be on the show, right?" But um, but Mel was like, "I'm going to go out there. and I'm going to get get some creators for you." Yeah. And uh, he's been he's been roping in a lot of people uh, to be a part of the show. So thank you, yeah, Mel. I'm glad well. he coordinated us working working this out. This is awesome. All right, man. Well, listen, it's uh, like I said, it's been fun. Everybody in the chat, thank you for hanging out. Uh, give us a thumbs up and all those sorts of things. You know how that all that works. But uh, I appreciate you all for tuning in, and Jim, especially for you for hanging out on a on a this Tuesday evening, looking at your arts great. And again, I can't wait to meet you in person in uh, what about three weeks? Yep. Wow. Yeah. Be here before you know it. Exactly. Uh, this was great. Thanks again, Bill. Appreciate it. You got it. All right.